Hello, my name is Steve Brown, and I'm the worship leader at Vintage Faith Church. At Vintage Faith, we believe the Word of God is what changes and transforms a person. We hope you enjoy the next 30 to 40 minute sermon of the Word of God being proclaimed and explained. Enjoy the message. Greetings and happy fall. Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Jeremiah. I'm reading Jeremiah 29, 1 to 7. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah and the queen mother, the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elasa, the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. It said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Well, good morning. A few announcements before we get into the text this morning. Tuesday, 6.30 at church, we start, it's going to be about a six to eight week series on the Imago Day, the image of God. Uh, there is a book um, for the study, but you do not have to have the book to be part of the study. There's going to be some dialogue, um, some study. It, it, the format's still being worked out. Depends on how many people come. But that starts this Tuesday, 6.30, here at church. That's the 28th. Last week, I got two dates wrong on, on my announcements. So I don't know what was going on. You shouldn't have given me the mic for announcements, I guess. <laughs> I announced that the fellowship meal was in November. It's actually next week. October 3rd, I have that date right. That's next Sunday, right? That's next Sunday? Just checking? Okay. That's next Sunday. So after, uh, after service and worship, we will do what we used to do before the pandemic and bring out tables and bring some food, please. Um, potluck, we'll eat, we'll enjoy each other's fellowship. That's next Sunday. November 7th, we are packing the shoe boxes. I think I had the wrong date on that last week. We are packing the boxes, and we'll have some pizzas and stuff after, but that is November 7th, after service, will be Operation Christmas Child, packing the boxes together. That'll be fun and a good time. We'll get to shoulder to shoulder, um, hang out and do that. The other thing is, if you haven't filled out one of these, Please do. Um, We have one of the ways that we communicate at at Vintage Faith is through an email newsletter. I fairly weekly, bi-weekly will write um, on that, and it's usually some kind of theological topic. But we're going to start putting all the going-ons and the happenings in the newsletter. So there's going to be two emails going out from Vintage in a a given week. One might be just some kind of theological topic. The other's going to be, hey, this is what's going on this week at Vintage Faith or this month. So to get on that, you have to give us your email and just make sure you give that to me or or someone, me or Steve or Donna. All right, well, let's, let's pray and let's get into it. Heavenly Father, Oh, we, we all just come before you this morning in different places. Some of, of us are anxious. 
Some of us are worried about things that are beyond our control. And Lord, that anxiety is eating us up. And we just ask for your spirit to to come down through the whole worship service and, and relieve those who are struggling with anxiety and worry. Lord, there's others in here that are just heartbroken and broken, and and we pray that your spirit come in and and just heal their hearts, speak to their hearts as as their heavenly Father who loves them, who, who wants to draw near to them. So Lord, for the people who have come in here brokenhearted, we just pray for comfort through your Holy Spirit. And Lord, there's others of us who come in here who need to be challenged. We, we may be living in a way that we think is okay and, and your word says otherwise. And Lord, for those people, I pray that your spirit will tenderly challenge us and get us right back on, on the narrow way, the, the, the good way, the flourishing way. Lord God, we as a people come to you with all sorts of earthly needs And we trust that your spirit will minister to them. So we we give them all to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, church, welcome. It's Sunday. Like I prayed, we we all come in here with, with different burdens on our hearts. So I do... I hope and pray that the text can speak to you today. Um, we've been in Peter. We've been in Peter for, for 21 weeks. We're, we're done. And this is going to be a bit of a transition sermon. If you remember the end of Peter last week, he talked about writing from Babylon. Peter talked about writing from Babylon. And the whole letter, he's using this language of being exiles, and he's kind of connecting the church to Israel. He's using a lot of, uh, of Old Testament language. He's like, you're, you're, you're priests of a kingdom, of an almighty God. You're exiles, you're sojourners. He's using this language intentionally, and he's trying to say, church, you are essentially the true Israel. That's a, a teaching in the New Testament if you haven't heard it. I would challenge you to to dig in or ask questions. But this idea that that Peter is exploring of of Babylon is is a big idea in the Bible, and I want to unpack that today just a bit. It goes all the way back to Genesis. So let's, let's begin here at the Tower of Babel. Some of you may know what the Tower of Babel is, what that story is. Some of you may not know what happened, what that story is. It's in Genesis 11, and I'm going to read a bit from Genesis 11 and, and, and unpack it a bit. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top to the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. So just to, to keep in context where, where we are in the biblical storyline, there, there had been a flood, and God gives the, the people after the flood the command again to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue the earth. And then we come to Genesis 11, and we see the people on the plains of the land of Shinar, Put that in the back of your your mind here, because that's going to be a connection. We see them saying, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower to the heavens, lest we be dispersed over the face of the earth. So the Tower of Babel is the rebellion of men and women against the word of God. 
God said this, we're going to do this. We know better than God. We know better than God's word. Instead of filling the earth and subduing it, we're going to come together and build a name for ourselves. Instead of exalting God's name, we're building a name for, for us. Instead of humbling ourselves and calling out to God in need, we're going to show our power and we're going to reach to the heavens. However many thousands of years ago that this story happened, the Tower of Babel represents the pride of man and the rebellion against God. The great theologian Augustine of, of Hippo said it this way. He said, "There's really the, the story of human history is the story of two cities. The city of God being built, the kingdom of God by the ways of God and by the commands of God, or the city of man being built in rebellion to God on the pride of men. And we can find this story playing out in our own hearts, in our own lives. We can have building projects in our own lives that, that are directly against God. Like, I, God, I, I know you said this, but I don't care. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to build my life on this and not your word. And this should recall to us Jesus' word saying, are you building your life on the rock? Or are you building your life on sand? To build our life on the rock is to build the city of God. All right. So the biblical storyline happens. We, we have the Tower of Babel and we have this, this pride of man, this arrogance of man. And what does God do? He comes down and he confuses their language and he scatters them over the face of the earth scatters them all over the face of the earth. In the very next chapter in Genesis, God calls a man named Abram. We know him as Abraham. And he tells Abram, come. Come to this land that I'm going to give you. I will bless the world through you. I will give you offspring and, and a seed is the word. And I will multiply you. And Abram has a son, Isaac. And Isaac has a son, Jacob. And Jacob is later renamed Israel. Jacob and his family, about 70 people in all, are taken because of a famine. They're taken into Egypt. 70 people, 400 years later, later they're in slavery but it's a nation. It's no longer a family of 70 people. It's a nation of over a million people. It's the nation of Israel. God truly kept his promise, be fruitful and multiply. And they did. But they're now in slavery and working hard and being treated and oppressed. And you know the story. God raises up Moses Exodus 8.1, then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him, this is what the Lord says. Let my people go so that they may worship me. Let my people go so that they may worship me. Moses is going to eventually lead them out and Joshua will lead them in to the promised land where they build the temple and they worship God. But I want to ask you this morning, have, have you ever considered this truth? Do you know that you were made to worship God? Do you know that that's the, the chief end of man? To worship God in the way that God commands to be worshipped. If you think about the Old Testament, 
How does a sinful man approach a holy God? You've got, that's why you have the whole book of Leviticus. Like, how, how do you do this? You're, you're, man is sinful. God is holy. How can sinful man approach holy God? There's all sorts of sacrifices and, and many details involved in that process in the Old Testament. But do you know that you were made to worship God? And now when you think about worshiping God, we can worship God outside of church. We can can worship God eating a good meal, watching a baseball game. You can give glory to God. You can worship God in all of life. But I, I want to put another category in your mind. Do you know that Sunday, the Lord's Day, that, that there is a gathering of the people of God that God sets apart and says, this, this is set apart, this is special. You're going to come together you're going to sing the word. Scripture is going to be read publicly. Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs are sung. The Lord's Supper is taken. When people come to Christ, there will be a baptism. Those are the ordinances of the church. The word of God is proclaimed and preached. The prayers of the saints go up together to God. And when God says in in Exodus, the Lord says, let them go so that they may worship me. That is the kind of worship that he is talking about. They can worship God in, in any way in Egypt by doing their work, by eating in their homes and their families. God is saying, let them go because I want to show them how to worship me. And I would submit to you that there's something in your heart that you need when we come together and we do this and we lift our voices up and sing and proclaim God's truth together, that there's something mysterious that happens in that. So God leads Israel out of, out of slavery, he leads them into the promised land, sets up this elaborate worship scheme, but they disobey Israel disobeys God. God gives them warning after warning after warning. And finally, it's enough. I brought you into this land. I will now take you out. So we have in the book of Daniel, we have this. Daniel 1, 1 to 2. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar. So again, here's going to be our connection to Babel. Babel in the land of Shinar, Babylon in the land of Shinar, Babel, Babylon, same thing. Both the city and the tower represent man's utter rebellion against God in every way. The lust of the flesh, the pride of the eyes, all of it. Babylon and Babel. So what happens? God takes his people in to the promised land, and then after rebellion and rebellion and rebellion, he's like, nope, you're going actually to Babylon, and you're going you're gonna to learn some things in Babylon. He brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. So this is the book of Daniel, which we're, we're not going to get into, but if you want to know, hey, what was it like for the people of Israel to live in Babylon? That's the book of Daniel. If you want to read about how were they warned, That's going to be the book of Jeremiah. You're going to hear Jeremiah saying, come on, guys, listen, 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 and then finally into Babylon. But they get into Babylon, and what starts happening? All the prophets start saying, hey, it's only going to be a little while. Just chill. Don't even unpack your bags. It's going to be a little while. God's going to rescue us. You're going to be delivered. You're going to be out. Just chill out. He's coming. And I want to connect this to Peter, and I'm going to do this as we go along, but if you 
Remember, Peter kept talking to us as your, your exiles. This world is not your home. If you try to make this world your home, you're not, something isn't going to feel right. Your home is the hope of heaven to come. But Peter isn't telling us to have our bags packed and to be on the edge of our seat, ready to get out. If you remember from Peter, he, he talks about submitting to the government, submitting to each other. How do, you, how do we live in Babylon? We have to have a life in Babylon. All right, so we go back to, to the Old Testament. People of God find themselves now out of the place where they worship God in a strange land where all sorts of things are going on. Sexually depraved, power is, is unhinged, and they just want to get out. They want to get back. Jeremiah 27, 16 to 17. Then I spoke to the priests and to all this people, saying, Thus says the Lord, don't listen to the words of your prophets who are prophesying to you, saying, Behold, the vessels of the Lord's house will now shortly be brought back from Babylon, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you. Don't list, do not listen to them. Serve the king of Babylon and live. Why should this city become a desolation? So you have these prophets, prophets of God's people who are raising up and saying, don't worry, church, it's going to be a short time. We're out of here. The, the rapture is coming. It's coming. Don't worry. Look at all this craziness around us. Don't worry. God's coming. Don't worry. And Jeremiah is going right into that way of thinking. He's saying, that's a lie. Don't listen to them. There's a parallel to this, as I just said, in, in modern day Christianity, and, and especially after 2020, with all the madness that, that we saw in the last year and a half, all the YouTube prophets began to percolate in the Christian community. And, and you might not be as connected as I am to some of that stuff, but people will send me, what about this video? What about this video? And people, pastors are having dreams, and they're making statements. And guess what? They're not coming to pass. Amen. Amen. They're not coming to pass. There was a pastor who talked about some invasion in, in November. and I mean, these are videos that have 50,000 to 100,000 views. Christians are eating this stuff up. Don't listen to them. We've been here before. Jeremiah, don't listen to them. In the book of 1 Thessalonians, we have a situation going on where the Christians were saying, okay, he's coming, Christ is coming back, the second coming is here, and what were they doing? I'm not going to work, why do I need to work? Why do I need to, to put any effort in? God is coming back, the, the kingdom's coming, can't you see? The kingdom is coming, why do I need to invest myself in anything earthly and they're rebuked for doing that. Um, a quote from Lee Ganier, As we noted in our study of 1 Thessalonians, the problems in the church at Thessalonica with members who were not working likely were due, due to a belief that the return of Jesus was imminent or had already happened. So it was pointless to keep laboring because everything was about to change. And that's the same thinking that can just ease its way into to our minds or the church in a year like 2020 when you've got riots and the capital being stormed and a pandemic. You hear even from the non-Christian community at that point saying, is this the end? Right? It's crazy. It feels crazy. But we've got to resist our impulse to lean into that. So the question that Jeremiah 
the book of Jeremiah is asking, the question that the book of Daniel is asking, and the question that Peter was putting forward in the book of Peter is, how do God's people live in a strange land? Do we wait with bags packed at the door, just waiting, or do we actually settle in? Does God have a word for us here? How do we handle this? And I believe God does have a word from us from the book of Jeremiah, and I believe it speaks to us today. All right, here we go. So Jeremiah writes the exiles in Babylon a letter. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah and Queen Mother, the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elisah, the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. All right. It said, so here's the letter. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. And pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Again, remember, Peter's using all throughout the book of Peter. He's using Babylon exile language. He's connecting these two books himself as he talks to the Christians in the Roman Empire. As we should apply to ourselves as Christians where we live today where we're not, if we look around, it's not as bad as Babylon would have been, but it certainly feels like we are moving in that direction. How do we live in Babylon? And you might be thinking, well, didn't all throughout Peter, Pastor, you were talking about don't put your hope in this life, put your hope in the life to come? Yes, absolutely that is true. It's a, it's a tension. The Bible has a lot of different tensions of two truths that sometimes in our minds see, seem seemingly contradictory, but they're both true. Put your hope in the life to come. All of the Christian's hope is in the promise that will one day be fulfilled. All of it. The resurrection. The resurrection, our resurrection, the world to come. Death is no more. Pain is no more. Sin is no more. That's our hope. That drives us now. But we don't live with our bags packed, ready to get on the flight. God is telling us to be salt and be light and get in and, and work. The first thing that I want to note in what we just read in Jeremiah 29.4 well, let's, we'll read it again. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. God placed Israel in exile. God has you in exile. In this time, in this place, providentially placed you with the friends that you know, with the people that you work with, in the church that you're in, you have been placed. And you might ask, well, what does this matter? Why does this matter in our exile? And I would say to you that it matters, every, it all, it matters the most. God's providence 
He is putting us here. There's a reason for us being here. Acts 17, 26 says, He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. So think about this for a moment. You were born maybe from 1950 to maybe the late 40s to recently. You didn't choose when you were born. You haven't chosen where you're born. You didn't choose your parents. There's a lot in our life that is providentially placed by God. We have free will to to do things, but our will is limited. God's will is not. You have been placed in this time, in this place, in this exile for a reason. And that should motivate you. It motivates me. Like, okay, God, you put us here. Things seem crazy all around us. How can I be salt and light in this time, in this place? How can I live out my faith in this time, in this place? You were made for this time, in this place. So back to Jeremiah 29, 5 to 7. What does he tell them to do? Again, the prophets are telling Israel, it's not going to be long You're going to be out really soon. Don't settle down. You're going to be out. God is a deliverer. He's going to deliver you. He's coming. Again, the the Christian prophets of our day are saying the same thing. He's coming any day now. He's coming. And how many have predicted the wrong dates of his coming? Build houses. Live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there, do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. So Christian, you're... You're in a metaphorical Babylon. Peter hit that point all throughout his letter. How should you live? Take on long-term projects. Cultivate your life. We'll get there in a minute. But as Christians, this idea of the imminent return of Christ can sometimes work against what God's calling us to do. And not only that, we have a consumer mindset working against us. The world around us, all the stuff we watch and see, is telling us your identity is in what you buy. You're a consumer because it's a machine that wants us to buy more and more. So we have these two forces working against us, but the reality is you're made in the image of God and you are made to actually cultivate and and work things that take long periods of time to cultivate and work. Uh, Two modern-day sociologists talking about this idea of consumption and and cultivation uh, say this. Consumption has filled the vacuum of meaning in the 21st century and plays a powerful role in our ambitions. You might not get an interesting job after all, not everyone can, but you can moderate the anger and sadness at missing out by acquiring goods that describe you and how you live your life. They're just getting at the point like, hey, consumption, this idea of I want to buy something, has has filled a vacuum of meaning in our world. And I I would kind of pause it today and and just say that I think one of the vacuums and the biggest vacuum that that has filled is that God made us human beings to cultivate. He made us in his image to cultivate things, whether that's a garden, a family, a home, a marriage, children. These things take long-term effort, long-term discipline. And everything 
is coming against you saying, no, you're not a cultivator, you're a consumer. Buy, buy this, buy this. Our impulse as image bearers of God should first be to cultivate, and Jeremiah is getting at this point. He says, build houses. Again, he's, he's saying, settle down. Don't, don't, these prophets, again, are telling you that, that you're going to be out soon. No, you're going you're to be there for a long time. Build a house. Settle in. Plant gardens. Gardens take time to, to cultivate. Till the ground, till the soil. Produce fruit and then do it again next year. Oh, my, families, right? You, that takes time. That's not check-the-box kind of work like I'm done with it, let's move on. That's day in and day out, loving your wife, loving your kids, teaching your kids, disciplining your kids. This is hard work. Any single, mo- or single moms or uh, moms uh, that, that don't work, that, that have kids, like, your job is a cultivation job. That's a job where you're not answering an email, boom, done. Answer another email, boom, done. The job never ends. That's cultivation. That's what Jeremiah is getting at, and that's part of the Imago day. You were made to be cultivators. You're not always going to see the fruit of cultivation. It's going to come up much, much later after the work is done. Amy and I were talking a few weeks ago, or might have been last week, and we were just thankful for some of the friendships that we had have in our life. And we were kind of contemplating, like, you know, there's, there's people here that we know deeply, and, and there's people that we, ha- we have friends that we know deeply. And it occurred to both of us, like, wow, and it wasn't always like this. Like, we, we have friends around us now that, that I know their heart, they know my heart, I feel comfortable with them, I don't have to, I can hang out when I'm at my worst. But that took cultivation. That took week in, week out, month in, month out, year after year after year. Let's get together with these people. Oh, I don't really feel like it, that person annoys me. <laughs> well, let's do it anyway. Right? We, we're so quick to, to cut and run. Like, ah, they, they said something that ticked me off. I'm done with them. Let's move on. But when, when we talk about cultivation, we've we got to be thinking about it. This is, this is friendships. This is church. This is your spiritual life. This is your mental life. This is your relationships. This is your finances. All of it. Cultivate. And I believe that's the word to to the church through the prophet Jeremiah. Proverbs 6, 10 10 to 11 says this, A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. That verse, of course, is is, is first talking about money, but that, that is... Everything, that's relational. A little sleep, a little slumber, ah, I don't wanna I don't wanna I don't wanna see them anymore. Reading your Bible. A little sleep, a little slumber. Eh, I don't really feel like doing it. Coming to church, developing relationships within the body. When I reflect on any of the hard seasons I've had in in my life and how God walked me through those seasons, it occurs to me that, yes, in that moment, reading his word helps me get through it, but usually it's the, all the the reading and, and, and the being with you and worshiping that when I get to that point of a struggle, there's this bank of spiritual capital built up and just ready to to be the thinking of how you approach a trial, the thinking when you you lose someone. It's all there. This is cultivation. This is day in, day out, building something. Last 
fall we did a covenant study here. It was a 22-week study. It, it, it was pretty intense for those that, that were here. You, you remember that. And I, I, in the beginning, I could see the smoke coming out of everyone's head, including my own. Like, man, this is hard. We're trying to get our minds around this. But I know from talking to many of you that you, you're thankful. Like, that opened up something in the Bible to you that you didn't have before it. And it took reading and coming and, and being there. And, it, and that's just, again, I think as Christians, when we see the world on fire around us, we can have an impulse to just, number one, look at the news and worry. Number two, Jesus, come back. And we should do that. We should. Like, Jesus, come back. I, I am for that. But it's probably going to be a long time. And we're here. And how are Christians salt and light to the world around us? We're, good. we're going to get to that. We're, there's a way that we relate to God's creation that is different from Babylon. There's a way that a Christian relates to God's things that is markedly different from how the world who does not know God relates to God's things. One more uh, proverb on this, Proverb 21.5. The plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty only comes to poverty. So I, I, just as one practical suggestion, and I just started doing this. I'm 47 years old, and this is fairly new in my walk, but I've read them before, but it's new to really be thinking about the Proverbs. The Proverbs, the wisdom literature in the Bible is real, practical, just sound advice for believers. And I think all too often we, we can ignore them and look past the Proverbs. But there's, there's a lot there. Are you diligent? That's, that's my question to you. Everyone in here is going to have different levels of discipline in their life. And I'm, I, I want, I'm not trying to put law on you right now, like, hey, you should be doing this. Listen, the Lord restores the years that the locusts have eaten. So if you're thinking... What about me? I'm, I'm X amount years old and I haven't done a lot of the stuff you're talking about, Pastor. The Lord restores the years that the locusts have eaten. But no matter how old you are, you can start cultivating, start cultivating, dig in to something. Starting new things is easy work. Diligence is the hard work. The day in, the day out, the practice you want to be good at guitar, well, you can learn a, a few things right away, but to be really good where you can freely play like these guys and, and play up here, you've got to practice. You want to learn a language, you're going to, put, you're going to be burning that, the smoke's going to be pouring out of your head. Starting new things is easy, but diligence is required for, for fruit, relational fruit, Spiritual fruit, financial fruit. A quote from uh, sociologist Dwayne Elmer. Whenever individualism reigns supreme, and that's what reigns in our day and age, community is easily sacrificed for personal preferences. Although I enjoy the luxuries of individualism, I can't help but feel that it has brought a certain impoverishment. Too quickly we splinter churches, friendships, families, and groups rather than struggle for ways to bridge and forgive and reconcile. So we live in, in a day and an age that's just telling us, hey, you can choose anything. And we can. We, we can choose. There's a lot that we can choose. But what Elmer is getting at and what I'm trying to, to plant in your mind is there is a certain call that the Christian has to cultivate. To cultivate things that matter. To, to, to make, and and to, to produce things. Like some of you in here, I know you have skills. Again, I mentioned the guitar. I know some of you work with wood. And, and, and others, you know, it, it's poetry. And, and you guys, these are gifts from the Lord. Learn them. My, oh my, and I know the older people in here, when you, you get to a certain age and you're like, man, I could have done this in my 20s. I could have really invested 
I could have learned some things that would be paying fruit now. And we don't want to live, we don't, we don't live in, in, in regret, but, but if, if you're in here and you're younger, use your time wisely. Invest. Read, read a classic. Read a book, a novel. I mean, they're classics for a reason. Not everyone in here is, is readers, I know, but what, what is it? How has God created you? How can you cultivate um, other than the obvious of, of your spirituality, your, your friendships, your relationships. Why does all this matter? Back to Babylon and Babel. The Tower of Babel was man's utter rejection of God and God's ways and God's word. The city of Babylon where Israel found themselves was the epitome, the manifestation of that spirit. Sexually immoral, using power, wrong, oppressing people, worshiping the king. Babylon represented the spirit of Babel. Towards the end of the Bible, for those who who like Revelation, Babylon comes back into the picture. And Babylon in the end of the Bible is metaphorical of the world, the world's power, the world's system, and the world's immorality. And that's why Peter can say, in one sense, he's referring to Rome, because at that time, Rome was that power. But when we get to the book of Revelation, we're in a metaphorical Babylon here. How should we then live? Why does any of this matter? Anthony, are you telling me that me taking up a hobby or learning guitar, learning a language, reading a classic, that you're telling me that matters? And I would say, yes, it does. Yes, it does. Romans 1, 22 to 25, this is what Paul diagnoses what's wrong with all of humanity. You want to know what's wrong and try to figure out what's going on out there? Why are people doing the crazy things that they're doing? Why are these ideologies rising up that just don't make any sense and seem to be against God? Why is all this happening? Romans 1, 22 to 25, of all people, including us, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. This is Babel. This is Babylon. This is the world we live in today. And this might rub against some of you, I know. But what's wrong with the world is we don't need better technology. We don't need more education. People have rejected God. People have rejected God, and they have worshipped creation over the creator. That's what's wrong. And it goes wrong in our lives all the time. We can subtly worship creation over the creator. But the world has said, Babel said, Babylon said, and the world today said, we don't want the God of the Bible. He puts too many restrictions on us. We want to be our own God. We've got this God. Get out of the way. That's that's it. And that's the spirit of Babel. That's the spirit of Babylon. And as children of God... You and I are the salt and the light in the world around us. And we're all here, everyone here is embedded in communities, families, places where you're in metaphorical Babylon. You have relationships and you can show the people around you. Number one, yes, preach the gospel. Yes. But if you're sitting there with your bags packed, ready to go, and not stewarding the creation and and the relationships and everything around you, and you're preaching the gospel. I I don't know what kind of gospel that that is. To me, that doesn't square with how we're called 
to live. We are called to be salt and light. One of the ways you're going to do that is to enjoy God's creation the right way by worshiping him and enjoying his creation. That's going to come out in how you raise a family, what your marriage looks like, even in your hobbies. It's going to come out in your skills, in your job, in your neighborhood. Like this is living in in Babylon. Live Christian with wisdom. If anything, and I know I've been all over the place, but if you get anything today, that's the message. Live your life with wisdom. Don't back out of the world just because the world seems to be on fire. David Noggle is a theologian, and he says this, if we refer all our human activities and experience to God in love, so give it to God in love, everything's from God, everything's under God, work, marriage, sexuality, children, family, relationships, food, rest, recreation, place, and anything else you can think of, then we can discover contentment, satisfaction, fulfillment, and joy. All summed up in the word shalom. If you know anything about the word, it's a Hebrew word, shalom, and it just means it's perfect balance, perfect peace, shalom. This is the world before the fall was in shalom. If God is the proper reference point for all things in life, then God gives them their true meaning. This is quite different than the hedonistic, so this is the Babylon. This is quite different than the Babylon view of happiness and the pious view of happiness. The worldly mistake is to focus on physical creation forfeiting the soul. So that's the worldly mistake. That's the Babylon mistake. It's all about the flesh. It's all about what I can see, touch, forget about the soul. I'm going to do follow every single passion I have. That's the message that the world is giving you today. And he's like, that's the worldly mistake. But the church makes another mistake sometimes. It's to focus only on the heavenly creator, forfeiting the body for only the soul. And the reality is the biblical teaching is body and soul together, material creation, good. It's all from God. The Gnostic heresy was all this material creation is evil, the soul is good. And I would just warn you, when you start bleeding into that kind of thinking, you are not in line with the God of the Bible. The material creation is good. And you, again, you might be thinking, but Anthony and Peter, we were talking about how crazy the world is. Yes, that's true. It's corrupted, but it's still good. It's from God. And we as Christians image him rightly when we show the world around us how that looks. Christian marriages should be different than marriages in the world. Often they're not. Christian families should be different than families in the world. Often they're not. Christians in the workplace should be a testimony to the Lord, and often they're not. And we can go on and on and on. Give glory to God by what you do. Cultivate something. Cultivate your life. And cultivation is hard work. There's, you're not checking boxes with cultivation. You're not seeing fruit right away with cultivation. You're waking up and saying, are you kidding me, Lord? I got to do this again? I feel like I'm taking a step backwards. You're telling me to do this again? Week in, week out, week in, week out. Be faithful. And you will see fruit. You will see fruit. Psalm 24, 1 to 2. We'll end with this. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Church, we're in Babylon. The world's on fire. But it's God's. It's God's world. You are God's children. It's ours. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, we thank you 
We thank you for the wisdom that you've laid down in, in your word. And Lord, I, I pray for hearts in here, if, if anything felt like law to certain people, that they can just be comforted, that God loves them, and whatever their history is, that, that they can just begin afresh, begin to, to cultivate, whether their kids are out of the home or not. Maybe they're a grandfather, a grandmother. Show them that they can still cultivate their life even if they're at the end of their life. Lord, I pray for the young people in here that they can steward their time well, that they can not be distracted by social media and bouncing from hyperlink to hyperlink to hyperlink and just skimming the surface of things, but they can think and learn and image you and just show your beauty from how they were created. Lord, help us to be a church that isn't sitting here with our bags packed, ready for the plane to come, that Although we desire and we cry with the scriptures, come, Lord, come, we do, and we hope in that, the the, the next coming of Christ, but we also are here and that we can acknowledge that you sovereignly, providentially placed us here, that the people that you have placed in our lives are not the B team, that there's not some awesome, amazing life waiting for us outside of what you've already given us here in front of us, in our homes, in our families, in our work, at our church. Help us to to really grab hold of that truth, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that, that you have given us a hope beyond this life and all the beauty that we can see in your creation and the gifts that you've given us there is certainly evil lurking around every corner. But help us to live in that tension, Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening to the Vintage Faith Podcast. At Vintage Faith, our vision is to help people who are far from God to become totally devoted followers of Jesus. We pray that this podcast brought you closer to God. For more information, check us out at vintagefaithcicero.com.